good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening. Whenever you're watching this video, we are so grateful that you're choosing to spend some time worshiping with us here at Brighton United Methodist Church. We want to welcome you to this virtual worship for October 18th, 2020. We have a couple of exciting developments uh, happening. Uh, even as we speak, we are preparing to transition to our very first in-person, indoor worship in nearly seven months since March. We are planning to launch our uh, socially distanced, in-person, indoor worship starting on October 25th. We're very excited about this opportunity and we want to invite you to find your way to our website at brightonunitedmethodistchurch.com where you'll find a link where you can RSVP to that service. We are limited in the size uh, of that service, and so we want to make sure that we have room for all who would like to join us in person. You, there you can also find information about all of our ministries and how you can plug in. If you have questions, of course, you can always reach out to the church office or to me directly, and we'll do our best to answer your questions as we transition into this new and exciting time uh, of this COVID season. We also want you to check us out on Facebook. Find our Facebook page, and there you'll find events related to our virtual Bible study. You can plug into our, uh, our midday prayer break each and every weekday at noon and join us for some prayer. You can catch up on all the news and information you need. Go there. You'll find all that information and inspiration that you could need to get through your week with us. Now, as we make the transition to our uh, in-person worship, I want to assure you that we are going to be maintaining this virtual worship as long as we have need. So in the foreseeable future, you will be able to find a worship experience right here where you found this video. And I want to encourage you, if you're not feeling well, or if you're just not comfortable coming in person yet, uh, stay home. Take advantage of this virtual worship and be reassured that, uh, that you will continue to remain connected with us here. Now, as we make our transition into the atmosphere of worship today, we are invited into worship through the words of Psalm 116. This is verses 12 through 19. What shall I return to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your serving girl. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer you a thanksgiving sacrifice and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vow to the Lord in the presence of all his people in the courts of the house of the Lord in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. The psalmist remembers all that God has done for him and wonders how he could repay God. Obviously, we can't repay God, but we can join together in worship, bringing our thanksgiving sacrifice to God, giving glory and thanks to the God who provides all that we have, we come in worship to offer that sacrifice of thanksgiving and praise that we might humble ourselves in the glory of our Lord together. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we come before you to offer that sacrifice of thanksgiving, that offering of glory and praise Lord, gather our hearts together, knit them one to another, and in doing so, pour out your Holy Spirit afresh upon us. Fill us to overflowing with that Spirit, Lord, that our hearts might be strangely warmed, that our minds might be truly inspired, that you would take hold of our lives and transform us to your glory, now and forevermore. Do it, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.
Well, we've come to that time in our service where we invite the children and youth down front for an opportunity to uh, engage in a children's message centered around this guy right here, God's Mystery Box. Today, we have an entry into God's Mystery Box from little Ava, who sends in a picture of her tea set. Here you can see it uh, with flowers and uh, all ready to serve uh, a lovely tea. Now, how do you suppose we could see God in our tea set today? What do you think? Do you have any ideas? If you do, I'd love to hear them. Go ahead and uh, put them in the comments below, or you can uh, send them to me by an email. I'd love to hear how you can see God in our tea set today. You know, it occurs to me that tea is something that is best shared with friends, right? When we have a tea set, it means you're probably enjoying your tea with someone else. And that's really important for us as we think about God because we can imagine maybe having tea with God. God is always there, so we're never alone. But even better, God wants us to be in relationship with each other. Do you have any friends? Or maybe you have siblings? Or maybe you have your parents? There are people in our lives that help us to see God all the time. We can see God in the way other people love us, and they can see God in the way we love them. So the next time you see a tea set, here's what I want you to do. I want you to think of somebody that you can have tea with. I want you to think about a friend or a sibling or a parent, and I want, to, I want you to reach out to them and invite them to share some love of God over some tea, okay? All right. Now, if you'd like to help me with the mystery box uh, in the coming weeks, we are going to continue to be doing our virtual worship and want to continue doing our virtual mystery box. So if you would like to help and, and bring something for the box, all you have to do is send me an email at revkershaw at gmail.com, and I'll select a different child each week to bring something for the box that we can then see God in whatever you bring, okay? All right, let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the friends and the siblings and the parents of this world. Lord, we thank you for all the ways that you show us your love, that you support us through our friends and family. And Lord, we thank you for those chances to be together. Lord, we give you thanks and praise in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. We begin our time in prayer with a prayer of confession. We are called by God, who is mighty to save and faithful to forgive that we might confess our sins before him, that we might repent and turn to him always. We will join today in a general prayer of confession together, and then we will pause for a moment of silent prayer, inviting you to lift up any personal confessions to God, and then we shall embrace the forgiveness of God together. Join with me with a strong voice, and a contrite heart, that we might humble ourselves before God and confess. Let us pray. Almighty God, most merciful Father, who created us for life together, we confess that we have turned from your way. We have not loved you with all our heart. We have not loved one another as you commanded. We have been quick to claim our own rights, but careless of the rights of others. We have taken much and given little. Holy God, whose compassion never ends, we ask you to forgive us our sins and to blot out all our guilt that we may know again the joy of your Spirit.
through Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, our God is mighty to save and faithful to forgive, so may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins through Jesus Christ our Lord, and strengthen us to live in the power of the Holy Spirit all our days. Amen. And now, having received afresh the forgiveness of God, we now join our voices and our hearts together in declaring our faith in God through Christ as we join in sharing in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and of earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. continue our time of prayer by lifting up our joys and our concerns and I want to encourage you if you have a joy or a concern that we can be lifting in prayer with you to send that to us through our prayer email address at brightonumcprayers at gmail.com when you send in a prayer request there they come directly to me and when I get them I pray for them immediately and then I send them on to our prayer warriors that our whole church family might keep you in prayer uh, and if you would like to sign up to receive our prayer warrior email updates, you can go to our website at brightonunitedmethodistchurch.com and look for the link to our MailChimp service uh, where you can uh, enter your email address and get those updates. Be a prayer warrior with us. Together, we will be praying with and for one another, contending for breakthrough in the mighty name of Jesus. Now, as we collect our hearts and minds together in prayer, we offer a prayer for the anxiety in the midst of all of the storms we face in this troubling season. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, creating and sustaining Lord, we come to you humbled in prayer, surrounded by the storms of this season. Lord, we see the land around us ablaze with forest fires. We see homes threatened and lives endangered. And Lord, we look around at our pandemic, the ups and downs of numbers and news, of infections, of those in the hospital. And Lord, we, we gaze with dismay at the rancor of this season as we enter into the home stretch of election. Lord, there seems to be so much pulling us apart at the seams, and yet we, we are here. 
We are here in prayer and we long for you to move miraculously. Lord, quench the fires that burn our land and threaten our homes, that endanger the lives of our friends and neighbors. Lord, eradicate this virus. Bring wisdom to our leaders and peace in the midst of this storm of fear. Heal those who are sick. Sustain those who are weary. And Lord, guide our leaders, guide our conversations, guide our nation, Lord, into evermore expressing your kingdom on earth. Lord, we pray that you would bring that wisdom upon us as we venture to vote, as we look to our leaders to lead. Lord, open doors for us to shine your guiding light before our nation. Lord, so much of these storms is crippling us with fear and doubt and anxiety. Bring your assurance. Bring a sense of peace that comes only in the presence of your Holy Spirit. Lord, hear our prayers and respond in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the one who taught us how to live, the one who shows us how to love, and the one who brings us together in prayer as we now join in saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Hi, my name is Paul. Today's scripture reading is John chapter 15, verses 1 through 14. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in that in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does not bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that will bear much fruit showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that you may join, you may joy my may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. You are my friends if you do what I command. Word of God for the people of God. Well, grace be yours and peace from Jesus Christ our Lord. Here we are. Coming down uh, the stretch, this is the final uh, installment in our series on humility. And in the last three installments of this series, we've been talking about how it is that we develop a biblical humility. We began uh, with prayer, that it is through prayers of praise, prayers of intercession, that we become humbled before God, that we are reminded that God is God and we are not. We develop, in fact, the humility we're talking about in this series, humble humility, biblical humility, is born in prayer. It is cultivated in service. Service was last week, re recalling Jesus uh, teaching the disciples, I have come to serve rather than to be served. Remember that when we were exploring service, we were looking at Mark's gospel. In chapter 10, verse 45, Jesus is responding to the disciples upset that James and John have asked for permission to be at the right and left hand of God, or of, of, uh, of Jesus. And Jesus says to them, uh, Jesus says to them, the Son of Man, his way of referring to himself, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life a ransom for many. I have come, the Son of Man came, not to be served, but to be served, and to give his life a ransom for many. One of the other passages we looked at last week had to do with Philippians 2, Paul returning to this description of Jesus' character when he says in Philippians 2 that, that we are to let the same mind be in us that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. There's that servant piece. Being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He did not exploit his being equal with God, but became obedient even to death, death on a cross. You see, 
our humility is birthed in prayer and fueled, cultivated through service, but it is perfected in sacrifice. It is perfected in sacrifice. You see it right there as Jesus is referring to uh, his own call to serve rather than to be served. He immediately adds and to give his life a ransom for many. As Paul is describing the, the service element, making himself a slave of Jesus, he immediately pivots to add and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now, we all know, as we turn our attention to today's passage, we all know, uh, thanks to Tim Tebow and others, probably the most famous passage of Scripture, maybe the most widely memorized passages of Scripture in John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that everyone who believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Right? We all know that. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Now, curiously enough, if you happen to look in 1 John 3.16, we get a similar but a completing verse. Not a competing verse, a completing verse. For if John 3.16 is for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that everyone who believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. 1 John 3.16, the epistle, the first epistle of John, in the third chapter, the 16th verse, reads this. We know love. Remember God so loved the world? We know love by this, that he, Jesus, laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. Before the crucifixion, Jesus is teaching, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that those who believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That eternal life is the gift of God through the Son because God loved the world. Now we know in John, 1 John 3.16, we know love by this. That Jesus laid down his life for us and that we ought to lay down our lives for one another. The love that God had for us that comes in the form of eternal life through Jesus comes because Jesus laid down his life for us. And because Jesus laid down his life for us, we, we are called to lay down our lives for one another. If we can agree that Jesus is our model for biblical humility, we cannot separate Jesus' humility from his sacrifice, you see. Jesus' humility was expressed not only in prayer, although there as well, and not just in service, but for sure there, but ultimately in sacrifice. Giving of himself for others. Remember, humility is born in prayer. It is cultivated through service, but it is made perfect in sacrifice. I knew last week that we were going to make the connection here between service and sacrifice this week. I knew as I read those passages from Mark's gospel and from, uh, from Paul's letter to the Philippians, I knew that we were going to make this connection between service and sacrifice. And it was hard, let me tell you, it was hard to keep from preaching this week's sermon last week. But because these two aspects of humility, they are so closely related, but fortunately, I think we got her done. Well, today we complete it. We complete it. And to complete it, I want to actually begin where we left off last week in that story at the beginning of what we call the farewell discourse, the Lord's last supper with his disciples in John chapter 13. In the gospel of John chapter 13, you'll remember is the story of the beginning of of uh, Jesus sitting down to the Last Supper with the disciples. And as the meal was beginning, he got up from the table. And he goes, takes off his robe, ties a towel around him, fills a basin with water, and washes the disciples' feet. The form of a slave. He's doing the job of the slave, or the 
house servant, not the job of the Lord and teacher. And you may remember when we encountered this last week, we pointed out the teaching that Jesus gives us in 13 verse 14 through 17. So Jesus is teaching them after he's washed their feet and put the robe back on and sat down at the table. He teaches them, so if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set for you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. Okay? Remember, this is, the found, this is one of those foundational passages, the stories that we pointed to when we were making the case last week for service as being a cultivator of our humility. Jesus says right here, I have served you, your teacher and master, and if I have done it, then you ought to do it to one another. I've set for you an example. Do as I have done to you. Jesus says you ought to serve one another as I have served you. Now, John chapter 13 is just the opening of a five-chapter scene in the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is 21 chapters long, so five chapters dedicated to one meal. The rest of John's Gospel covers roughly three years in a total of 21 chapters. And nearly a quarter of those chapters are dedicated to one meal and what Jesus says to the disciples at that one meal. So it stands to reason that as Jesus is speaking, this meal must have had a profound impact on John, the gospel writer, the beloved disciple. As he looked back on this in the, through the lens of the resurrection and all that he understood to be his mission as a, an apostle turned disciple, he must have looked back on this meal and all that Jesus taught and thought, this, this is important. This is how John chooses to use his biography of his Lord and Savior. And so as we pivot from serve one another as I have served you, do as I have done, we find ourselves in chapter 14, where if you remember, if you've been to a funeral, you may have, uh, you may have come across John chapter 14. This is the uh, believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many rooms and I go to prepare a place for you. This is where Jesus teaches, I am the way and the truth and the life and you know the way because you know me. Now, later on in chapter 14, as he works his way through what we call now the farewell address, we get to verse 20, and Jesus is teaching, On that day, he says, On that day, when you will no longer see me, but you will see me, and because I live, you shall live. And he says, On that day, that you live because I have lived, On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. Keeping commandments are an expression of love for Jesus. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. And Judas, not Iscariot, says to him, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Listen to what Jesus says. He says, those who love me will keep my word. Remember earlier, keep my commandment. Those who follow the commandments express love for Jesus. Okay? Those who love me will keep my word and my father will love them. And we will come and come to them and make our home with them. So what Jesus is saying is following my commandments. Following my word will result in love, and love will bring love from the Father, which will encourage us to live with you. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. So Jesus is making this connection between love and keeping Jesus' word, following Jesus' commandments, and keeping Jesus' word is the way He's calling his disciples to express love and therefore open, avail ourselves to the presence of God, the Father, and Jesus in the person of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So love is keeping the commandments. Now, we look forward. Remember, this is all one discourse. It's all connected. 
We look forward into the next chapter, into the chapter that we read for today. And in chapter 15, Jesus makes these connections about abiding in uh, God and and he abides in the Father, and the Father abides in him, and you are to abide in Christ, and Christ will abide in you, and it's this linked chain, right? It's this, it's this vine. You are, the, you, know, you are the branches, I am the vine, my Father is the vine dresser, right? He's talking about abiding. How do we abide? Well, as we get down to verse 7, he says, If you abide in me, and my words, my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. How do we do that? Well, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Here's that theme again. Keeping my commandments is expressing love for God. It's also how we abide in love, how we remain in love Okay? We remain in the love of Christ. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments, Jesus is an example to us, remember, and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that, you, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Why is that? This is my commandment. Okay, he's just said, he's just said for at least the second time in two chapters that Following his command, following his word, abiding in his word is love. Okay? Following Jesus' command is loving God. Now, this is my commandment. He's about to clarify for us. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. So now we have in chapter 13, you ought to serve one another as I have served you. You are to express your love for me by following my commandments and obeying my word. You are to abide in love, which is obeying my commandments. And here's my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. And love in its greatest form Here it comes, love in its most ultimate form, right? No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. And then he immediately calls them friends. We abide in Jesus' love by keeping his commandments. He just said in verse 10, that we love by keeping his commandments. And in verse 12, he says, this is my commandment, love one another as I have loved you. And in 13, no one has greater love than this than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. What is Jesus saying here? What is Jesus saying? In living a humble life, service always leads to sacrifice. Right? In living the humble life, service... Service, remember the the cultivator of our humility. Service always leads to sacrifice. Now, it might not be your whole life in every instance, but it's sacrifice nonetheless. Humility, we've defined a couple of times before in this series, humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is not, remember, insecurity. It's not thinking less of yourself. Remember what we said it is? It's thinking of yourself less. Meaning, my priorities are not about me and what I want and what I need, but about others and what they want and what they need. John Wesley put it like this, that, that we have a bent to, towards sinning. Sinning is an expression of our selfishness. And the more we straighten that bent out, orienting us to God and to neighbor, Loving God and loving neighbor in the form of that ultimate, greatest commandment that Jesus teaches us. The more we straighten out that bent and our orientation is toward others, the more we're going to think of ourselves less. It's not about thinking less of ourselves. Do you see the difference? Do you hear the difference? It's not about thinking that I'm terrible, rotten, no good, unworthy, less than. That's not humility. 
That's insecurity. But thinking of yourself less and putting others before you, that's, that's at the core of humility because service ultimately leads in the humble heart to sacrifice. We all know that it is possible to engage in service for selfish reasons. We all know that it's possible to engage in service for selfish reasons. We know that it makes us feel good, right? We've all experienced that. We've done something good for someone else. It makes us feel good. And that's not a problem. But if we're doing it so that we feel good, that, that is a selfish reason. We can do it so that it makes us look good to others. This is Jesus from Matthew chapter 6 in the last series when we talked about the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus teaches them to remember give and pray and fast in secret. Don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. But if, we motiv- if we're motivated to serve so that it makes us look good in the eyes of others, look at that person. They're giving of themselves so much. Look, they're always constantly helping other people. Look, they're constantly always doing that. Let us heap praises upon them, right? We do things, sometimes we serve for selfish reasons, making us look good to others. Sometimes it even gives us a sense of the moral high ground, like perhaps we're better than others. It begins to create a pride problem in our hearts. Selfish reasons. We know that it is possible to engage in service for selfish reasons. So service by itself does not fully create humility. Service cultivates humility, but humble service will always lead to sacrifice. Jesus, Jesus, in this extended teaching, in this farewell address, is trying to help the disciples understand the crucifixion which happens the next day. He's trying to give them the tools that they are going to need to understand what's about to happen to him and through him to them. Now, here is the amazing thing, right? We said that this discourse goes on for a couple more chapters, but I actually want to go back to the beginning. I described both last week and this week the scene of the Last Supper, beginning with the foot washing of the disciples, Jesus getting up from the table and wrapping the towel and all. But I actually want to go back to the very beginning, and I want to read these verses to you from the beginning of chapter 13, It says, now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Keep that in mind with what we've already talked about. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. So Judas is already resolved to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table and took off his outer robe. This is an important preface for us, you see, because Jesus begins the Last Supper with this act of service in washing their feet knowing that Judas was going to betray him. Knowing who would betray him. Knowing about Judas, he washes his feet. You see, Judas gets the service talk, doesn't he? Judas is there when Jesus says, I have set an example. I, your teacher and Lord, have set an example for you. You ought to do as I have done and serve one another. Judas gets the service talk. Right, But before, before the end of chapter 13, before we get into the teachings of 14 and 15 that we've just gone over, Judas gets up from the table and goes to do his betraying. Right? In the very end of chapter 13, near the very end of chapter 13, Jesus foretells his betrayal. And in verse 30, he says, So after receiving the piece of bread, this is to Judas, after receiving a piece of bread from Jesus, he immediately went out, and it was night. It's only after then that Jesus begins to illuminate 
the fact that service isn't enough, that service must be paired with sacrifice. Before Jesus gets to the sacrifice talk, see, Judas is there for the service talk, but before Jesus gets to the sacrifice talk, Judas is already off. Now, speculations abound, not only in scholarship, but throughout the centuries of faithful believers who have read the scriptures and wondered, how is it that Judas could have followed Jesus around for three years? How could he have been empowered to uh, see Jesus working miracles? How was it that he is a witness to Jesus calling for Lazarus, four days dead in the tomb, into a resurrection? How is it that Judas could, could be empowered by God to do those things himself, to cure the sick and cleanse lepers and cast out demons and raise the dead himself to preach the kingdom of God? How is it that Judas could have participated in all of that and yet still, still betray Jesus? Well, there are obvious answers that people have floated over the centuries. Money, those pieces of silver, greed, Maybe he wanted more power for himself. One of the more plausible explanations that I've ever heard, and one that I, I personally feel, although nothing in Scripture really leads me to this, it's just sort of, a, it's sort of a gut feeling that there's something right about this, is that Judas was somehow attempting to pick the fight. Right? He was, he was trying to usher in the, the conflict that would ultimately result in the reestablishment of God's kingdom, literal kingdom, in the place of modern-day Israel. Judea, Galilee would be united as the kingdom, free from Roman Empire, free from foreign rule, as it had not been for centuries at that point. I could picture Judas so zealous for what he had seen Jesus do, decide to pick the fight he thought Jesus would win. Who knows if I'm right? Who knows exactly what motivated Judas, for sure? But think about this for just a moment. One way to think about this is that Judas got the teaching on service, but tried to divorce it from the teaching on sacrifice. Judas was wanting to pick the fight he thought Jesus would win, but he didn't realize that Jesus was going to fight a totally different battle. He did not get the teaching on sacrifice, and so he misunderstood that Jesus was there not to win the earthly battle to set them free from Rome, but to win the cosmic battle to set all of humanity free from the, from the thumb, from the boot of the enemy, holding us under our own sin. Sacrifice, you see, is how Jesus wins. He's obedient to death, even death on a cross. And when Jesus says in John 15, 12, love one another as I have loved you, that's sacrifice. Love one another as I have loved you. You are my friends. And what is the greatest expression of love? To give up one's life for one's friends. Jesus is foreshadowing for the disciples at this last supper that their service isn't enough. It has to move to sacrifice and they need to follow Jesus' example. They need to respond to Jesus' commands to sacrifice. We are not called to simply benefit from the sacrifice of Jesus, though. It is not enough that we benefit from the sacrifice of Jesus, but to humbly embody that sacrifice in our service, laying down our lives for our friends. Or put differently, put differently, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, Jesus says in Luke 9, 23. That famous instruction if anyone would come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me daily. We take up that cross daily and follow Jesus. It is not enough for us to rely on Jesus' sacrifice. We must engage in sacrificing ourselves. In modeling humility, Jesus doesn't think less of himself. He is still the Son of Man, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. 
but he thinks of himself less, laying down his life for us and then calling us to take up our crosses and follow his example. We are called to lay down our lives in humble service, born of prayer, that for those to whom love is a stranger would find in us generous friends. Paul, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I have been crucified with Christ, Paul says, and calls us to do the same. We must be crucified with Christ because it is no longer we who live, but Christ Jesus who lives in us. Amen. Are you ready for your homework? I hope you are. I want to encourage you. We are not about the theoretical here at the church. We want to put our uh, teachings into practical use in our everyday lives, and that begins with the Thirsty 30. That's 10 minutes of Bible reading, 10 minutes of prayer, 10 minutes of worship, 30 minutes to God each and every day. I want to challenge you. If you have not done any of those things, to pick one this week and make it your goal to do that one 10 minutes each day this week. If you've been doing some for a while, or maybe you've been flirting with that 30 for a bit, but you haven't been consistent, challenge yourself this week to get to that thirsty 30. Do it every day. Now, if you've been doing the 30 for a while, and you've been consistent there, I want you to challenge yourself a little bit more. Give a little bit more to God. You will never regret giving more of your day to the God who gives us each and every day. Okay? Now, while you're in the midst of doing your thirsty 30, I've got a prayer assignment for you. We're going to connect the dots, right? Praying is the, the birthplace of humility, and it's cultivated, right? It's cultivated in our service, and it's made perfect in our sacrifice. So while you're praying, I want you to pray, Lord, open a door for me to demonstrate your sacrificial love for another. In other words, how can you be a generous friend to another this week? Open the door. Pray, God, open a door for me to demonstrate your sacrificial love to a friend. Okay? Let's pray. Holy and gracious God, we hear your call, and it is a weighty call, to sacrifice of ourselves that others might know your love, that others may come to know your saving grace. Lord, we ask that you would open those doors for us this week, that you would give us the courage to not only see them, but to walk through them, sacrificing of ourselves to share your love, to follow your commands, to be friends to the world. Lord, do it through us in the mighty and the powerful and precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. You know, we hear the call of the gospel to offer our sacrifice to God, to give of ourselves, to think of others more than we think of us. And so we come to a time of giving when we are encouraged to give generously. You know, God calls upon us to give not because he has need of our gift, but because he knows just how much we need to give how much that cultivates a joyful and humble heart in the presence of God, to give back a portion of what God has entrusted to us. Let's face it, everything we have comes from God. And so we give a portion of that back that the kingdom might be built in the name of Jesus. Now, if you would like to donate to our ministries and contribute to our uh, furthering the kingdom in this place, you can do that in a couple of ways. First of all, you can mail us your check. We do, in fact, get the mail. You can log on to our website at brightonunitedmethodistchurch.com forward slash donate and uh, make your donation online. Or you can uh, set it up with your financial institution to send us your contribution automatically. However you do it, first of all, we want to thank you for your generosity in supporting our ministries. 
And we want to encourage you to give out of that generosity to the glory of God. Now, if you find yourself in need for some reason, maybe you've lost a job, maybe you've had uh, your hours cut, or maybe you're facing some sort of uh, uh, crisis in your life that maybe we could help with, with a financial uh, assistance. We have an emergency assistance fund that we would like to use to help you. And so I want to encourage you to send me an email at our prayer email address, brightonumcprayers at gmail.com. You send in what you uh, are needing, what we can do, you think, to help, and we will do all we can to help get you through this troubling season. Don't let pride or shame get in your way. Let us, your church family, help you. And now, may we give generously our sacrifice to God. Gracious and loving Father, you have given us all that we have. We give back a portion of what you have entrusted to us that your kingdom might be built here on earth. Lord, shine your light through these gifts. Bless them that they may be an encouragement to our community, that they might be a sacrifice of joy and praise and thanksgiving. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. place. May you go to live a life led by prayer, filled with service, sacrificing of ourselves for the good of others. Go, and as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.